Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? This is Ken Clark. I'm the regional director for U.S. Term Limits South Division. We also have Ron Ron on. He is the regional director for the Western States. We've got Nick, who is the uh, executive director, and Scott, the national field director. So, Ron, why don't you introduce yourself first? Yeah, absolutely. So this is Ron Hooper, and I'm the Western Regional uh, Director here with U.S. Term Limits. And so hopefully we've got a bunch of our people from all over the West Coast that are dialing in. So make sure you go into the comments section and let us know where you're from. Scott. Uh, as Ron mentioned, please do go in the comments section and let us know where you're from. It's great to see everybody. And uh, when you're doing comments in the comments section, please try to keep them short because of the way that Facebook has it set up. A lot of times, long comments, uh, it's very difficult to read them from start to finish. So if you can keep it to just a couple of lines, it would really help us out. Scott Tillman, I'm in Michigan, apparently the only place where they're not having really serious weather. Uh, although I guess Arizona never gets serious weather, but um, we're not having any serious weather here. It's all good. Uh, and I'm the National Field Director at U.S. Term Limits. I run the pledge program and uh, kind of manage our field operations. We also have Nick Tumblees with us, and you'll see him fading in and out. Nick is experiencing a power outage just in like the last two minutes and uh, thought he would be able to get back up and running. He may or may not join us as we continue. Well, and thank you again for joining us. This is our Thursday Facebook broadcast that we've been doing very consistently every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. And we try to cover a whole host of topics and a whole host of issues. The underlying bottom line is that we're trying to get everyone who's watching involved with U.S. term limits. And what we're trying to do is put term limits on the United States Congress. We want to limit the terms of U.S. Congress. We're not doing this on a state level. We're not doing it on a local level. It is specifically geared towards Congress. And so there is a methodology, methodology that we're using that is constitutional that we're um, trying to push out there. We've done grassroots recruiting. We've done how to talk to your legislators. We've done a whole bunch of different things. And Ron, Ken, and I have been um, pushing out different things that each one of you can do to help us make this happen because it can only happen if you get involved and help us out. So today we had Nick and Scott on because they were going to go over a couple of different things. And so Scott, why don't you real quick lay out what you guys were going to do and I'll kind of go back and forth with you and Ron a little bit um, until or if we get Nick back. Great. If not, then you and I'll just hammer through it. Well, one of the things that we know is that an overwhelming majority of Americans want term limits on U.S. Congress. The polling is 80, right around 75 to 80 percent to typically between 9 to 11, 9 to 12 percent against. So it's overwhelming. It's like 8 to 9 to 1 in favor of. Um, we know that it's that popular. And, you know, since we live in a representative, uh, you know, a republic that's governed by representatives, you would think that we would get what we want when something is that popular, but we don't. And the the people who oppose us come up with all kinds of funny excuses. So we thought it'd be very fun today to talk about why we need term limits. Everybody seems to understand that we need term limits. Why is that? What reasons do we have that we need term limits? And there's just a few things we'd like to delve into. The biggest reason that we need term limits is because the people who are in those seats have a huge advantage over any competitors. And this is, we call this incumbent advantage. So if you're an incumbent legislator, there's a huge advantage that you have over anybody who wants to challenge you for that seat. Uh, and this, there, there's a lot of different things that play into incumbent advantage. There's some really easy ones to spot in, in that we wanna kind of address and talk about today. The first one is franking. Um, this is a fancy way to say that as an elected official, as a government official, you can mail on the government dime the people who live in your district to tell them about things that are going on. Makes sense. Some big thing is going on. It's very important that a congressman should be able to, or a state senator or a, a federal senator, I'm sorry, should be able to tell their constituents about what they're doing and what's going on. Oftentimes, though, you'll get a piece of mail and it has, you know, your congressman's picture on it. It comes within three months before the election. And it talks about all the great things that that congressman is doing and all the great things that they're fighting for. And maybe it comes to certain people in the district um, talking about um, some fiscal conservative type things that the congressman is doing. And maybe it goes to other people in the district talking about some socially progressive things that, that the congressman might have supported or opposed. 
depending on um, you know where the congressman might think that he needs support. It's not supposed to happen that this is abused, but the nature of it is it does happen. And there is a legitimate need for you know a congressman to go out and, and tell constituents things. But the guys that are challenging those congressmen, the men and women who run against an incumbent, the challengers, they don't have the ability to send out you know, mail talking about where they are or what they plan on doing on a specific bill or piece of legislation based on what's going on. They don't they don't have taxpayer money. They have to go out and raise money to, to spend on those things. So there's a huge, huge advantage there. I think Nick's back with us. Let's see if he's got sound. Hello. Hey, Nick. We're talking about um, incumbent advantage. Nick is the executive director with uh, U.S. Terminals. He's based down in Melbourne, Florida. Uh, we're talking about incumbent advantage, and we just got into it. We're right at the moment talking about franking and what that means, mailing on the taxpayer dime, why there's legitimate use for it, and how it's abused. And Can how anyone hear me? <laughs> yes, Nick. We can hear Nick, but Nick can't hear us. Yeah, I don't think he can hear us. Well, let's, so we can't let's, hear anything. let's keep moving on that, Scott. Um, Nick evidently can't hear us, but let's keep moving on that. You were talking about franking and the incumbent advantage. I mean, that goes above and beyond just the name recognition and the free publicity that these incumbents get, because let's face it, any congressman can get on television pretty much anytime they want, boosting their name recognition. But these are all advantages that they have that require a ton of money to overcome if you're going to challenge them, yes? Yes, there's there's nobody in the country that I've spoke with yet who doesn't think that it's important that we have fair elections. And when you talk about incumbent advantage, you really talk about how one side has an unfair advantage over the other side. We talked about franking. Ken mentioned um, name recognition. You know, congressmen, when they do the franking um, and other things, they get their name recognition out there. They've also run campaigns before. They're very experienced. They run these types of campaigns. People who want to be successful go and, and you know, at campaigns, go and work for congressional campaigns. And uh, they have an advantage that they have a machine that other Hello, people anyone have. Home? We hear you, Nick, but we don't see you. Uh, well, the other side of that whole argument is that we don't get our best and our brightest. We get opportunist. You know, we don't get real challengers. And so, you know, they're, they're, not only do they have an advantage, but the challenger looks like really weak compared to them. So our best and brightest know those odds are just unmeasurable. And um, well, and let's talk about that real quick, because, you know, we're all, you know, fairly sophisticated when it comes to politics. But let's talk about your typical businessman out there who um, let's say he's run a successful business. Um, he's getting ready to slow down a little bit, wants to give back. So he well, says, you know, I think maybe now comes my time to serve. He's going to look at an incumbent realize what it takes to overcome that power of the incumbency. And as just a typical anybody who can do that kind of analysis, he's going to scratch his head and he's going to go, you know, I'd be out of my mind to try to take that on. The hill is is Mount Everest. It's way too big. Scott? Yeah, this is this is something that um, we have a term for it. And I cannot think of the term off the top of my head right now. Uh, but what you're talking about is there's a seniority system in Congress right now. And the people who are in control, whether it's Denny Hoyer or Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi or anybody, you know, John McCain before he passed, these people have been there for decades and their power comes because they're in positions of leadership because they've been there so long. So let's say that you decide you want to run for Congress and maybe you're a businessman, maybe you're a teacher, maybe you've worked in your local community as a you know in, in your city maybe you've worked for a nonprofit. maybe you've worked with some other community organization if you decide that you're going to run for congress go to congress and you stand back and take an objective look at that what you're saying is and you, and you want to get something passed what you're saying is i figure i'll probably need to go and spend six eight ten years there and then i can be in a position of leadership maybe after ten years to finally start to move my agenda. And what we see is the people who are there and in leadership have actually been there for about 20 years, 15 to 20 years. So you've got to take 15 to 20 years away from your doing before you're finally in a position to actually start moving legislation. Now, let's say 15 or 20 years from then, your party's not in control. Now you might have to stay for another six, eight, 10 years to get in the party that's back in control. If you really enjoy public service and giving back to the community and you're looking at that and you're saying, I can either go to my business 
and then try to give back to the community through that. Or I can go back to teaching and try to give back to the community through that. Or I can go back to the, the city or the nonprofit that I work with. If you're really in it for those reasons, sitting around for 10, 15 years before you can actually make a difference on something is going to be very frustrating to you. And you might very well say, I'd rather just go out and influence my community as I can now, rather than waiting you know, 20 years to do it. And if you do go in and wait 20 years for it to, to do it, we know that a lot of people who sit in Congress for 15 or 20 years, their priorities change. We can look and see people who've been in Congress and, and we can, one of the easiest things to look at is look at somebody who runs for Congress. The first time they run, where does the money come from that they're running with? Almost every time somebody runs for Congress the first time, they put in a huge chunk of their own money. For some people that's, you know, 50, $60,000. For some people that's a couple of million dollars. The next biggest place that their money comes from is their friends, family, people they know from their past, their network, their connections, people in, in their community, people who live in their district, they donate the next biggest chunk the first time somebody runs. And after, since we live in a, in a, in a country where you know, a lot of play, races are decided in the primary, once the primary is decided, oftentimes the, um, the winner of the primary will all of a sudden get this huge influx of special interest money that's probably from outside of the district. In, in the case of a contested general, that, that money will wait until after the general, and then that money will come in to help them pay back campaign loans. A lot of You'll see when you look at campaign finance reports, a lot of people get loans for their committee. And what happens is after the uh, election, um, they've loaned themselves this money, and then every lobbyist group will come and donate the maximum amount, and then those loans get paid back by these lobbyist donations. It's a, a – I mean, it doesn't look good. But it is a what racket. it's a racket. Let's just call it what it is. It's a racket. So we know that the first time that somebody runs for office, the biggest place their money comes from is their personal funds and friends and family and district money. The second time somebody runs for office, they rarely put in any of their own money. If, if you're putting in your own money the second time you rent, run for Congress, something is drastically wrong with your race. And it's very, very rare. Like doesn't even happen every cycle to one person rare. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's like a once in a decade, not quite the storm of the century, but it's very, very rare. Where most of your money comes from the second time is special interest money. You're there sitting in D.C. and we've got reports from both the, the Democrat side and the Republican side that they sit congressmen in offices and have them crank out phone calls for hours and hours every day, you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a week making phone calls to raise money. Your money is coming from special interests. Your grandma still writes you a check. Your friends and family, they'll still write you a check the second time you run. But most of your money now, second time, comes from special interests. The third time, an even smaller amount of your money comes from in-district and your, your previous contacts, and more of it comes from special interests. And after the third term, almost all the money is coming from special interests. So you can really see if you think that where donations, if, if you think that donations and who's getting, you know, who's supporting campaigns really influences how a member votes, you'll easily see that over time, the influence moves away from in the district to, you know, special interests normally in Washington, D.C. We have Nick back. I see him, but I don't know if we can hear him. Nick, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. We're good. Yeah. Sorry, I've been plagued by technical difficulties. We actually had a power outage here a couple minutes ago, so now I'm back online. I'm Nick Tumbalides, Executive Director of U.S. Term Limits. Uh, it's an honor to be on with you guys. It's, it's always uh, great to talk about term limits, my favorite topic in the world. And I think it's needed now more, more than ever based on the dysfunction that we're seeing in, uh, in Washington, D.C. But, you know, I, I wanted to kind of touch on what you just said, Scott, because sometimes we will go up to a congressman and we'll say, well, why don't you support term limits, sir? And I'll say, well, we already have a term limit. Why don't you just vote me out? And, you know, it, that sounds right on the surface, uh, but practically speaking, that we all know that's not how it works. And they, the incumbents in Congress know that that's not how it works. They are privately working around the clock to build this arsenal of campaign finance dollars, of different advantages of incumbency, uh, you know, press coverage. They're sending campaign mailers at taxpayer expense. And what they're doing is they're really creating this huge barrier to entry around their offices to make sure that new people, that fresh faces and ideas are not able to enter into the process and run. 
So if you're looking at running for Congress and you, you, want, you have some good ideas, you want to change the system, and you're looking about running against an incumbent, more often than not, you're going to choose not to run because that incumbent has stacked the deck against you. That incumbent gets $9 from special interest packs for every $1 that you could possibly receive. So the game is totally rigged. Uh, they hold all the cards, and the, ch the chances of you getting elected against an incumbent are virtually impossible uh, unless you have 2 or $3 million sitting around in the bank. And how many Americans really have that sitting around? So I think one of the huge benefits of term limits is opening up the process to people from all walks of life who are not necessarily millionaires and billionaires, but have a desire to serve, have a desire to change the system before it changes them. Yeah, I really like that. And what people fail to realize is that, you know, running up against an incumbent and when they talk about the election process, it's it is not just that simple. So what you guys are talking about, Nick and Scott, is really important for people to understand because this is the system that we live in, unfortunately. And I get that objection all the time. I get people telling me, why don't we just vote them out? And if you take a look at what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, it's not any one party's fault. It is the system's fault. The system itself is corrupt. And we need to change that. They always say, well, it takes you two years just to find the bathroom. And that's a joke saying that the process is very difficult. That's what they mean when they say that. But if you had a bunch of freshmen in there or people that knew they were only going to be there for six or maybe eight years or maybe 12 years, whatever the case may be, and that was all the time they had to really truly get something done, they would change that system pretty darn quick, don't you think? Yeah, I do. I, I think I think when you get new people in there, they come in with a sense of urgency and a purpose. They know they have a fixed time to actually get the job done, and then they have to return home and live under the laws that they've made. They can't continue kicking the can on down the road for decades and decades and decades. And, you know, if you know right off the bat that you can't build an empire in Washington, D.C., that you're not going to be able to spend 30 years there and get millions of dollars sent back to your state so they'll start naming bridges after you, like Robert Byrd and people like that, then you're gonna, that's going to change the culture of Washington, D.C. That's going to give people political courage to tackle some of these big problems that are lying out there, like immigration and health care and, and uh, infrastructure and entitlements and so many other things that really threaten, to, threaten the fiscal health of our country. It's going to give people the courage to tackle those problems and not worry so much about what the consequences are of ruffling feathers with lobbyists and special interest. One thing that often gets brought up that goes right with this is people say, well, what about the institutional knowledge that you might might lose? But what Nick just brought up points out the institutional inertia that exists right now. Congress doesn't want to change. The Republicans in Congress can go out and raise money scaring people about immigration. And the, and the Democrats in Congress can go out and raise money scaring people about immigration also. They have no incentives to solve it because right now they can raise a lot of money by continuing that problem. And the leadership in Congress has no desire to change things. We just saw a huge um, you know, bailout where a lot of money has been spent to help try to help the economy. And they spent a pittance on the people and they spent huge amounts on all their cronies. And both sides signed on this bill. There was bipartisan support. For, for the whole thing. And it was all about lining the pockets of their cronies and then giving the American people what they thought the American people would need to stomach it. So that's why everybody got their, their, their pittance from this while the big businesses got huge bailouts. Well, and if you look at that, I mean, for let's talk about the pittances uh, compared to the bailouts. Every citizen, every individual got what, 1200 bucks something like that in the first bailout, yet it cost them $6,700 per individual in increased debt. Well, that's a pretty big margin, 1,200 compared to 6,700. So who got the difference? Where'd that money go? Scott, you're absolutely right. That went to the cronies. And, you know, and they pushed that through so hastily, as you know, they didn't even do a recorded vote. So no member of Congress is on the record. No member of Congress is being held accountable. Meaning if this whole thing goes haywire, if it blows up in our face, if later on we all decide that it's been a horrible policy, we don't know who to hold accountable and vote out of office for that because none of them had the guts to actually put their name on this on this bill. Um, but you're already seeing that, you know, the same people who claim that they are experts in policy 
are not even willing to read the bills that they pass. You know, we had uh, before this one, there was another coronavirus bill. I think it was like a 200 page coronavirus package. And they gave it to the House at midnight and the House was voting on it at 1230. So they had half an hour to read this 200 page bill that was just festooned with goodies. And I can guarantee you not I mean, these members of Congress, they are either the, the best speed readers in the history of planet Earth or they're not even reading the damn bills that they're voting on. I mean, at what point are we just going to say enough is enough? It's time to bring them home and start over with a citizen legislature. I mean, it, everything we're seeing in Washington today is just screaming, crying out for term limits. And it really it really puts a lights of fire under me, lights of fire under this organization, gives us this urgency we need to go out and get it done. So, Scott, based on that, we, we know what we need to do. So how do we do it? Well, there's two ways to amend the Constitution, and one of those ways is through Congress. But whoa, 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 whoa. Why do we have to amend the Constitution? So several states back in the early 90s decided that they wanted to put term limits in their own congressional delegation, and they passed those term limits at the ballot box in those states, and some states passed it at the state legislature. But there's a court case where a disgruntled congressman challenged that. Um, the League of Women Voters and uh, Thornton, who was a congressman from uh, Arkansas, challenged uh, his ability to be on the ballot. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court. It was U.S. term limits versus Thornton. And uh, in a 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court said that you can't go through and change it state by state, that instead they were going to require for a constitutional amendment uh, or for, for term limits on Congress, they were going to require an amendment that would apply to everybody equally. Now, realistically, it would have applied to everybody equally because more than half of Congress were would have been term limited by these state laws that had been passed and it would have taken you know about a month in session before they would have proposed and passed something that would apply to everybody equally but this kind of gave them a way to block it and since then since there's only two ways to amend the constitution we've been pursuing those two ways the first way of course is the way that amendments have been done previously which is to have congress propose the amendment but congress isn't going to propose term limiting themselves they don't like to give up power the other way is when the states can actually come in and say, we think that this is an important issue. When two thirds of the states, which at this time with 50 states is 34 states, when two thirds of the states say, we want term limits on Congress and pass a resolution asking for Congress to have an amendment convention for term limits, then Congress is legally bound. Then we can say, if Congress refuses to do it, we can go to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will force it. So right now we're passing resolutions at the, at, in different states. There are three states that have passed term limits exclusive resolutions and about 12 to 14 other states that have passed resolutions that include term limits. We need to get that number to 34. How we do that is we get state legislators to support the legislation. Um, state legislators oftentimes need to know about this. They need reminders. They need to be able to, we need to, you know, be able to say, hey, you've talked about this before. It's important that you get on and support it. To remind them and to get them on the record, we have them sign a pledge. And we can use your help getting to your state legislature to sign this pledge. If you go to termlimits.com, you'll see a link or to our Facebook page, you'll see a link where you can go through and send a message to your state legislator and also to candidates who are running for state legislature in your, in your, uh, in your state and in your district. And then you can reach out to them and ask them to sign the term limits pledge. Getting lots of these pledges is how we get this legislation passed and eventually how we get term limits on Congress. Nick, you had um, there. So, Scott, like you had said, there are two different ways to do this. Congress can propose amendments or we can have the states get together and propose this amendments. Now, Nick, you testified because we do have a resolution before the United States Congress and you went and testified in regards to that. So what are your thoughts or what do you think our chances are getting Congress to move on it? <laughs> I think the chances are the same as getting turkeys to vote for Thanksgiving. Um, so the, the chances are not great right now, but that may change. You see, the, the framers of our Constitution were, were brilliant people. They knew that you could not give Congress a monopoly over the amendment process, because if you did that, you would never get an amendment designed to curb the powers of Congress. And so, you know, you go back to the notes from the Constitutional Convention, you had George Mason, Charles Pinckney, James Madison recorded this. They came up with the amendment convention 
uh, the state initiated amendment convention where the states can bypass Congress and implement constitutional amendments, and nobody in Washington, D.C. can stop them. If you look at our country's history, throughout our country's history, the states have used that process successfully to catalyze constitutional amendments proposed by Congress. What this means is the, the bill I testified on, SJR 1 in the U.S. Senate, it's not going to move on its own. But if 25, 30 states say we want a convention to put term limits on Congress, then Congress may see the writing on the wall and they may have no choice but to propose that amendment on their own. We've already seen this happen. Several amendments in our Constitution right now, including presidential term limits, got their start when states were saying we want a convention. Congress realized it was inevitable. And so then they proposed it on their own. That that's actually that's absolutely correct. We've seen that happen time and time again. So I guess what the point of all that is, is that's why we're working through the states and the state legislators. That's why Scott was mentioning those petitions. Those petitions are designed for people running for state assemblies, your state assembly. So that means these are people that live in your neighborhood. They live in your, your district. These are people that you may know. These are people that you can influence because they're not these faraway people that go to Washington, D.C. These are people that live in your neighborhood. They shop at your grocery store. They go to the same barber. Your kids are in the same school a lot of times. So these are people that you can actually talk to and, and influence. And when you're talking about people that are in the state assembly, if they hear from their constituents, they're going to listen. Their constituents are you. You are their constituents. You're the people that they're going to be listening to. You're the people that are going to be able to get this happen or uh, get this thing pushing forward to make it happen. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? We need all the help we can get. It's very important that legislators hear from their constituents on this issue. We have people who call. We can use your help calling people. We can use your help emailing people. We can use your help finding contact information for legislators. If you have contact with a legislator or with somebody who's running for legislature, please reach out to us. If you're willing to reach out to a candidate whose district you live in, please reach out to us um, right through our website. Otherwise, you can email us at... Um, uh, well, the, the email address for that is on the website, too. So go to termlimits.com, look up the email address, and we'll get you connected with the person who can help in your region. We have, you know, several different regions around the country, and then we also have helpers in each state. Absolutely. Let me just add, why, why are we asking you to talk to your state legislators? Well, it's very simple. That is the way you motivate politicians. If you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. You can make arguments for term limits until the cows come home. You can explain how it will give us a better Congress, how it's going to fix our country, all that good stuff. That is ultimately not what will influence your state legislators. What they what influences them is the fear of losing their seats. If you bring 20 constituents into your state representative or state senator's office and you demand that that person vote for the term limits convention that we are proposing, we're introducing in all of these states, that will be the most powerful motivator. Fear is a very powerful motivator. Constituent power, grassroots organizing, that is the way that it's going to get done. Because politicians are never going to like term limits. Just like prisoners don't like prison bars, politicians don't like term limits. We need to make them do the right thing even if it's for the wrong reasons. I really like that analogy. Prisoners don't like prison bars. Um, politicians don't like term limits. It's kind of the same thing because we all know the only way to get an open seat election today is by death or indictment, right? I mean, that's pretty much it. That's the only way we're going to get an open seat. You election. know, I'm, I'm really disappointed today, actually, because I, some news just came out a couple hours ago that, um, I, I, let me just say for the record, I'm a big fan of sending politicians to prison. And um, we had a congresswoman in, in Jacksonville who went to prison, I think, for 25 counts of corruption. And she just got released today, two years early, Corinne Brown. Um, it was, you know, really, really disappointing. She had uh, run a false charity. She collected $900,000 in money that was supposed to be scholarships for underprivileged kids. She spent $1,000 on one measly scholarship, and she took the rest of the money to the bank. Uh, so I'm really disappointed in that. Right now, as, as it's often said, we have term limits and they're called indictments. 
I would rather get real term limits enacted. And that is why we're here. Yeah, Scott, go ahead and comment on that as well. I would rather that people were able to go home after a few years of good service than going to Washington, going native, and then only leaving, um, you know, after decades and decades and decades. So we've got a lot going on. And even though we're in the situation we are as a country, we still have an awful lot going on. We've got active legislation in a number of different states. I don't have Ken Quinn or Ron Hooper on right now to really go over it. And so I've got active legislation in a number of my states. I run the Southern region. Ken Quinn does as well. So does Ron. And so if you really want to help us go to our website, you can see where this legislation is. There isn't a single state in the union that we don't need help in, even the states we've passed. And so please get involved. We've got calls to action out in, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 states going on right now. We've got standing calls to action going on in 50 states. And so there are ways for you to get involved and you to come help us and answer the clarion call because this is it. This is the call. The trumpets are blaring right now. And it is a huge call to arms. We need everybody's help. You can see what's going on. You know that there's issues. This is what we can do to solve a lot of these problems. So go to the website, termlimits.com. Go to your state. You can find out what you can do to get involved and to help. You put in your email address, and it's going to come to one of the three of us, and we will reach out to you, and we will follow up. And so that is the main thing we need to do. Nick? Couldn't agree more. Uh, look at the polling. 82% of Americans want term limits. Uh, Congress has a 95% reelection rate and a 10% approval rating. Um, that is a sign of a horribly dysfunctional and broken system, but we're on the road to fixing it. We have a plan. It's a plan. We've looked at American history and we've seen that this plan has worked before. Uh, we've seen this has already passed in different states. We've passed it in my home state of Florida successfully, which is a, a very politically divided state. We had Republican and Democrat support in the state legislature. Let me tell you, if we can get it done in Florida, we can get it. I mean, we're, we're the land of hanging chads. If we can get it done here, <laughs> we can get it done anywhere. We just need your help. So go to termlimits.com, sign the petition, volunteer, get involved, help us leave your children and grandchildren a better future and a better country. Scott, I'll give you the last word on that. Please do contact us. We need your help reaching out to legislators. It's very important to get them on pledges. Thank you for all your help. Is there anything else you guys wanted to cover before we wrap this up? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And Don't forget to use hand sanitizer. Yeah, and we will be back. We're going to we're going to continue to do this every Thursday. We're going to do it at 3:30 p.m. every week. We again, we try to bring you different topics and different ways that you can get involved because everybody has their own hot buttons, everybody has their own uh, things that they're good at. And so we need your help no matter what it is. And no matter where you are in the in the country, we need your help. And there is something for everyone to do to fit your comfort level. Not everybody wants to talk to politicians. Not everybody wants to make phone calls. And that's fine. We've got things that we need help with. So please reach out to us. All of our email addresses should be in the comments. And again, go to the website, sign our petition, get your legislators to sign our pledge. Thank you so much for joining us. We will be back again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.